Welcome to the Mind of Business Success Podcast. I'm your host, Alicia Kramer. Our guest today is Jim Palmer. I'm excited to share him with you. From where are you right now, Jim? Uh, You and I are talking. We are in, uh, let me think where we are. Uh, We are in South Carolina, Georgetown, South Carolina, because we move constantly and sometimes I forget. (laughs) And for context, and because some people are not seeing that you are you are on your boat right now uh, doing this interview. Let's tell our listeners, those who are listening only. Mm -hmm. um, So you live on your boat. Yeah. Five years ago, um, Stephanie and I sold our home. Almost. We lived almost lived there almost 30 years, raised four kids. And, and then Stephanie was really getting burned out on her job. And of course I being self-employed, I could, I worked out of the house anyway, but I was getting tired. We had an acre and a half of grass, lots of trees, lots of lawn and all the stuff that goes with it. And I was done with it. And, um, she, when she left her job, uh, she just came home one day and said, let's go on a big adventure. And we didn't know what that meant, but for so long, we've been living the safe, predictable, reliable, you know, life that you would expect people like us to live, I guess, like a lot of people. And we wanted to do something way outside the box. So we came up with the idea of living on a boat and traveling. We had had, we have, we had a weekend boat, a 30 foot weekend boat at the time we sold that. So we're on a 50 foot, um, two bedroom, two bath motor yacht. And we travel, we've traveled to new England twice and up and down the Florida from Florida to, uh, the Chesapeake Bay five times now. So we're, we're, we're always on the move. We're not here just to live on a boat, right? But we're always traveling. So you asked me where we are. I have to really think about it sometimes. <laughs> now, what does it take to be an entrepreneur who lives on a yacht? Um, well, it takes a lot of hard work. You know, these, oh, this is the overnight success for me. I'm in my 20, almost my 22nd year now. My first year was revenue free, as I like to say now that it's history, <laughs> but then I grew very, very slowly. And, um, that was, I started in 2001 by 2007, I had created a successful internet business called no hassle newsletters, which I still have today. And then I created five more internet companies in the span of about three years. And in 2009, I started coaching. That's really my main business today, Alicia. And, um, but some of the things that I did, I'm sure we'll talk about some of the mindset hurdles, but I learned how to, um, uh, leverage my time and my talent by, you know, delegating a lot of things like no hassle newsletters kind of runs on autopilot right now. So all I do is coach my clients three days a week. Um, so it, there, there's a lot of things that go into it besides creating the success. And I'll share this real quick because when Stephanie and I started, what I do is I, I work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then weather permitting, we travel Friday through Monday. And then wherever we are Monday, I stop and stationary so I can have, you know, somewhat Wi-Fi, I guess, somewhat decent. Um, so there was a Monday we were traveling and we went to this spot and um, we, we put our anchor down and we put the, our little dink, we have a little portable, you know, inflatable dinghy, a little motor that we used to take our dog we, when we had a dog. And um, so we, we motored over to this restaurant and then we're motoring back to the, to our boat. And I'm like, oh God, I feel so guilty. Like most of the world's working. We're like, we just went to waterfront and it, and I really, honest to goodness, had to overcome some of that. And I, I helped my own clients with that today. I said, you have to have the courage to leave, to leave and live the life that you've dreamt of and set yourself up to be successful enough to live without, without the guilt. So it's a, there's a there's mindset to everything, as you know. We're going to talk a lot about that. And you are, you're really, really sharp when it comes to business and really sharp when it comes to marketing, but you're also really sharp when it comes to mindset because you've, you've been, you've been doing this long enough that you, you're very well-rounded. Um, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me, even having gone through so much inner transformation myself mm-hmm. that we still catch ourselves in these silly little like kind of like just BS that we've bought into. And um, when you mention about feeling the guilt, Mm -hmm. um, it's so interesting because if I'm working really, really hard on something, I oftentimes have to remind myself it doesn't have to be quite so hard. 
Right. You know, and there are these, I mean, go on social media, scroll through all the motivational stuff that's on there. And you're seeing all the cliches, hard work, persistence, and these things are true, right? But where Mm -hmm. we have to sort of reframe some of this stuff is hard work in and of itself doesn't equal success. There are people there. I I remember being in high school and I had a friend and her dad was working three jobs Mm -hmm. to support his, his children. He was a single dad, three jobs. That's working really flipping hard. And he wasn't he wasn't wealthy because he was working that hard. He was struggling. And we have to, we have to kind of create these new associations in our mind with what success can be for us. And it doesn't mean sitting there and, and meditating and all of a sudden clients and money and, you know, all the material yeah, trappings go, just fall into our life, right? <laughs> it's funny because um, you see me write, I, I, I always have paper and pen because my mind never slows down. And I, you, I, I know you and I are alike because I interview on my show and um, I'm just thinking of all these things just based on the two or three minutes that you, you set setting up the question. So uh, Dan Kennedy, big mentor of mine, you say, if, if it was really was hard work, then the bricklayers and the guys who load, unload the trucks or on the docks and all these, they would be the richest people. So it's not really how hard the work is physically. It's not even how hard the work is uh, if it's emotional, like if you're a scientist or something. What it's always, he goes, money is always moving in any economy, but it's always moving to value. When you provide the most value to a starving, hungry crowd, use that, that cliche, you will, you will do well, probably do well, but you'll even do better if you understand the difference between what you think your time is worth and what your time's worth from your customer's perspective. So people go, well, and this is one of the problems you know, with the money mindset is entrepreneurs, let's say, I believe everybody's born with a God-given skill or a talent. And if you build a business on that, you're good. So let's say you've you're a, you're a house painter and you've done it really, really well. And you can go in and do it. You, I mean, you cut the corners, you do everything. And if you only charge uh, for your time, time and materials, that might be a way to make a living. But what you have to realize is if you can paint that room in a day, it would take the homeowner four weekends, probably two days each. So you're saving him a ton of time. So he's going to base uh, the quote that you give him on what's it mean to me to have it done, to have it done right. And so I don't have to do it. Right. So that's, and you know, that's part of it. Um, I kind of forget the original question, but uh, hopefully we're skating in there. No, somewhere. that, that's, that I, doesn't even matter. Doesn't even matter what the original question is <laughs> because that right there is gold. So that is a mindset shift. That's incredibly valuable that I think virtually any type of business owner, doesn't matter what your, what your widget is, doesn't matter if it's a service or product or whatever, and to you be know, able to look at what is the real value that your customer or your client is getting because, and I've seen this over the many years that I've been working with clients, mm-hmm. that's not how people think they are still thinking with that employee time for money mentality is my service worth this amount of money in this hour? Not how many years worth of wisdom have I accumulated where I can give this client exactly what they need in this one hour that could take them 10 or 20 years to go out and discover on their own. Yeah. You know, um, it's interesting that no matter how much success you have, we all need help. We all have certain hangups. I mean, I work with a lot of um, new entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in six figures to mid six figures. But the, the biggest entrepreneur I ever worked with was doing $34 million, which I can tell you, I've never done that in a single year. Right? Yeah, but, yeah um, it could happen. But it came, <laughs> yeah. And, but uh, just a couple of years ago, Alicia, a guy came to me, said, I don't want to be in your mastermind. I just want to work with you privately. And I don't want you using my name. So that's fine. And um, but he was a high end sales trainer. So check this out. He's a high end sales trainer. He came to how do I get charged more for my services? And I said, well, 
off the top of my head, I'll give you a quick line, but then we'll go deep. I said, you should start saying I'm the most expensive coach you can't wait to hire. So think of what that, what's in that, I'm the most expensive. So that already puts it on the table like, okay, it's going to hurt. It's going to be, but you can't wait to hire means the outcome is going to be great. So I said, let me unpack it a little bit more since you're paying me a lot of money and you could just go use that. Right. But I said, um, you don't charge by the hour. You charge by the transformation because what he told me is he is so good at what he does that usually in about four to six weeks, he can have enormous change on somebody. I said, give me your best case scenario. And he said, he was working with a, um, a, a guy who was a mortgage broker or ran a, a mortgage broker off. And he said, the guy's doing about 150 to 200,000. So not too shabby, but he says, I could change a few things in about a month's time and I could have him doubling his income. And I said, what's the most you've ever charged for a six week program? He goes, $7,500. And I said, well, the next client at 1750, right? And he got it. The guy didn't even blink because I said, um, not his name. I'm not going to say his name. But I'll say Bill. I said, Bill, if you take a guy from 150,000 a year to even like 200 or $250,000 a year and he pays you 17.5, do you think 17.5 for another buck 50? I think that's a pretty good trade off. So him and I had this little thing. So his next client was 17.50. He goes, what do we do next? I said, I think either 24.5 or 27.5. So we went to 24.5. And the third client he had um, was at 29.5. And none of them blinked because we worked on some other stuff. But the point is, you don't charge by the hour, you charge by the transformation, right? What is your life going to look like? What's your business going to look like after you work for a period of time with me? And there's no reason in the world, if you're delivering some really amazing results, there's no reason it should be a small amount of money. I just want to take a pause for a moment. <laughs> for all of the people who are like, God damn it, you know, all these years. <laughs> Um, but you're absolutely right. And here's an interesting thing that we can sort of segue off into how many stories are people telling themselves about why they can't do that? Right. And that stuff doesn't just go away on its own. And some, in, in many cases, it doesn't go away when you break through that first milestone. And that's why we see all these people complaining about imposter syndrome and upper limit problems and all of these yep. things, because you can get yourself through enough internal resistance to, with a straight face, say 29,000. And on some level, you're aligned enough with that, that you can receive that. But now if you still got all of that other stuff in your mind, that's saying, I'm not worth it. Um, most people can't afford it. What if, what if I let them down? Um, you know, all the stuff, right? All that stuff. It can be really difficult to keep that positive momentum going. Right. Now, that's why you have a thriving business and I have a thriving business because in reality, you can't coach yourself out of those mindset hurdles. I call it head trash, all the stuff that's swirling around that stinks up there, right? So head trash. Um, and you know, I, I know you have a background, which is why you're in the field you're in now. Well, my background was I, you know, I struggled, I had money issues. <clears throat> I think somebody referred to it as top of the stairs thinking. So we grew up, I always thought we had money. My parents were like broke. My mom was a stay-at-home mom by choice, but my dad worked really hard, but I never knew how tight we were. Like, and at the, at the top of the stairs, they'd send my brother and I to bed, but we'd hear, well, do they ne really need new shoes? Can we go another six months? Can we just patch those jeans? Do we have to have steak? Can we just have hot dogs? I'm just making some of this up, but it's all based on there's not enough money. So that's like a general thing that we have to fix, right? And sometimes you can fix that yourself, but the big things are something that you have to work with somebody that A, has experience. I'm a I'm a big believer in don't hire somebody that's going to help you create a six or seven figure business if they haven't done it for themselves, right? So you got to get somebody with experience, boots on the ground experience. And you have to get, you have to also work with a coach who's been through the muck and has come out the other side. 
And it's interesting to me that um, it, with the success I've had as an entrepreneur and a marketer and things like that, what makes me a great coach today is the mindset stuff because nobody can pull the wool over. Like I help people write books. Oh, I stink. Well, th that's not a good reason. I can't write my book. No, you can't. No, I'm going to show you how to do it. And I mean, I can't charge enough. Yes, you can. Let's let's walk through it. Uh, I can't get in front of a group and speak. Yes, you can. I did it. Right. All these different things. You know, it 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 really is as much mindset. But the thing is. I don't put myself as a mindset coach. People are attracted to me for the business or how to create different multiple streams of income thing. But then once we get working together, I find out where it's like when you peel the layer, the social media layer back and then they, you build trust and they start, oh, Jim, I'm like so far behind my credit cards and stuff like that. And I said, okay, well, we can talk about that, but let's talk about how to grow your way out of it. Cause you can't, you, if you cut another magazine out, you don't get pizza once a month. That's not going to do it. But if we add another 50 grand to your in to your revenue and you can like pay those credit cards off like in two months or three months, would that be good? Yeah. Let's build your business instead. All right. Instead of thinking small, let's think big. And so, but that's not something you can typically do. For, I know because I tried I'm for my own, I tried to build my big empire, my own, and I did okay. I'm not saying I, you know, is completely clueless, but um, it's when I got into a mastermind and when I put myself in a, in a mastermind with high powered coaches who were doing like millions of dollars. And I'm like this, I'm floundering it. You know, I don't even know if I was doing six figures or maybe buck and a half way back then. And I'm like, Oh, I feel like, so, I feel like the loser in the room. I <laughs> think like that. Um, but it's when you, when you step up and take those steps and it, it can be painful. It can be embarrassing. I turn horrible shades of red when, when I get embarrassed, but I live through it. And I, you know, um, anyway, I, I love these conversations. And, and the little voice says, all right, take a breath and, and let your host jump in here. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's my take on this. I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. um, we have the conditioning. We have the beliefs. If our mind knew how to solve the problems, it would have done it by right. now. Now, when you learn certain methods to uncover some of your limiting beliefs and you learn certain tools for you know, reframing those things, releasing and letting that go, you can shift some things on your own. But oftentimes, if you really want to up level, you need to be around people who are thinking differently than right. you have. And some of my biggest growth has been because I'm always investing in growing as an individual and as a business owner. And so I'm hearing different perspectives and that's causing me to challenge some of my old beliefs, even if it's almost inadvertently doing it, right? right? Yes. There's something I call, um, I, I call it critical motivation, I, but I call it other things, but so what I believe is that, uh, first of all, when you become an entrepreneur, there's nobody down the hall that you have to answer to, whether it's the president, CEO, chairman, you're the big wig, the top dog, you're the chief muckety muck, as I like to say. And so you get to call the shots. So early on in my business, and I'll, I'll share with you that, you know, from childhood, I barely graduated high school because I refused to get up and speak in front of the history class and all these different things. And um, so I had, a, I, it was just a, dreadful fear of public speaking. Then when I started my business, I started getting invitations. Hey, come speak to our group about newsletter marketing, retention marketing. Then when I started putting out my books, oh, come talk about, oh, thanks. I'm really flattered for the offer, but I'm really busy. I'm traveling. I'd lie my butt off because I didn't want to go speak in front of a group of people. And um, it was about that time. Let me finish this uh, thought because I opened that loop there. So I think people will do things when, when they feel the proper motivation. But I could always, as an entrepreneur or a man or a person, I could justify why I wouldn't do something because I'm going to find a way to do it, go around it, whatever, right? But then um, my girls were uh, juniors or seniors in high school. I, I had twin girls. They both wanted to go to college. They both got married within 12 months of each other, five, six years later, <laughs> couldn't talk them into a double wedding. But all of a sudden, I'd always, my whole life, I wanted to be able to help my kids go to college. My boys didn't, but my girls wanted to. And um, 
So, but the way my business was going, it just, I wasn't throwing enough cash that I could, you know, write checks for tuition or whatever. And suddenly my inability to step up and go be a speaker, go put on my own events and do different things was impacting my kids and not just me. Right. And so, um, I felt that that was enough. And I think that people will always step up and do things for someone else or other people or a cause or, you know, something worthy than they will themselves. Like a, maybe a Friday night, you're dog tired. You're on the couch. You see so your friends invite you out for, Hey, let's go for pizza and beer. No, I'm too tired. I'm good. And half an hour later, the phone rings. Hey, it's Jim. You know, my mom's uh, fell down. Can you come pick her up and get me to the hospital or anything like that? You're off that couch and you're gone. We'll always do more for others than we'll do for ourselves. So I call that critical motivation. So if you're struggling and you can't get yourself into that, you know, that your zone of genius where you're going to really, really perform because you're okay with where you are. I'll grow next year. I'll fight. You know, then think of what your inability to take action means to your family, your friends, your, your community, your church, whatever, whatever's driving you, your inability to do that is, is affecting them. Yeah. It, it's a, a very, very sad, but true fact of life. It is how we tend to operate. Um, you know, I think on, on your, um, podcast, we talked about rock bottom Mm -hmm. and it's, it's really just recognizing that the way that we're wired is we will have that inner desire, right? That inner desire to grow your business. And you may know on some level that maybe speaking is the vehicle. That's the next logical step to incorporate into your business, into your overall marketing strategy uh, to get to where you want to be. And yeah. that, that tendency to justify, and this is a conversation I have all the time with clients. Our limitations are so fucking justifiable. Our mm-hmm. mind has perfected the perfect excuses to keep us right where we are. That's and it's right. not until we become so uncomfortable with our current circumstances, like what you said, your circumstance with your, you know, your daughter is not having the cash to write those checks. Mm-hmm. That was so much more painful than staying in your comfort zone that it pushed you out of your comfort zone. Oh, and in a big way. It would be beautiful if we could latch on to our passion and ride that as sort of that motivating force. Yeah. But that almost seems to kind of come after the fact for most people. So first they've got to have their oh shit moment, Mm -hmm. pull their head out of their ass essentially. And then once they start to get some positive momentum going, then they can ride sort of the passion train, so to speak, to all of that up-leveling. So the difference is, and I say this to some entrepreneurs, are you in it to win it or are you in it not to lose? Because those are two very different things. Most people, they'll have some modicum of success. In fact, a vast majority of entrepreneurs, they'll make about maybe what they made in, in in a job, but it's theirs. They're working twice the hours, three times the hours, but I don't work for somebody else. But I don't want to risk losing what I have now because I can make my mortgage payment. I got food. I can't do a lot of things, but I don't want to risk that, whether it's investing in a coach or paid advertising, whatever it is. So I don't want to, they're not willing to risk their current situation in order to get to the next level. That's a, that's a big no, no. Um, you know, when, so when I overcame, when I said, I need to get uh, overcome this because I was going to these conferences and I'm seeing people up on stage speak for 60 minutes, 70 minutes. And if people run to the back of the room and turn in order forms for 500, $2,000, things like that, I'm going, Holy crap, I could do that. That guy sucked. Or, you know, I'm looking at that and I think, so I can do this now, Alicia, uh, just because time was short, I didn't want to try one thing and then see if it worked. So I went to Dale Carnegie Toastmasters. I do. I did positive affirmations, and because I read a book, I think it was Psycho Cybernetics. Said do them once a day. I did them three times a day. I went to a hypnotherapist, and all I did all of it. And then I started small. I started speaking in front of this uh, small, kind of like a rotary style group of 20, 20 people. Next thing you know, 
about a year later, I'm in front of 300 doctors and I close $45,000 worth of business in an hour. And I was hooked. Right. And, um, and then the next big hurdle for me was putting on my own event, what I call Dream Business Academy, a three-day event. Now, the head trash was, oh, what if, what if nobody comes? And I put all this money out, you know, and you're, you get the guarantee. If nobody comes, you're still on the hook for all the stuff and the room and stuff. And then what if everybody comes that I want to have come and I get up in front, they introduce me and I freeze? Or what if I say everything I know that's good in the first morning before lunch. And what am I going to do the rest of the two and a half days, you know, but it turns out, you know what? And I'll say this unabashedly, I'm a hell of a good speaker and I enjoy it. And it's made me a lot of money. So I overcame it based on the fact that I didn't want to let my girls down. Turns out I'm really good. I enjoy it. And it's really made this lifestyle lifestyle possible. I love that. That's the happy <laughs> ending there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I've got to make sure that we we fit this question in. And we've talked about some of your mindset up leveling already, but mm -hmm. now I'd love for you to share with us maybe a slightly different mindset mm -hmm. obstacle that you had to overcome in order to get to where you are today. Sure. Um, so here's one and it's, it's, it goes like this. You will earn significantly more income for who you are and not what you do. So it has to do with creating your own celebrity brand. And I say celebrity, not like, you know, like, not like a Tom Cruise or somebody, but somebody who's recognized as the go-to person, the authority, the person who knows the most in the niche that you are in. So when I started learning about this strategy, I'm like, mm, that sounds kind of weird. I, I, my whole career, mostly because of public speaking and other things, I always kind of played under the radar, but I was serving the owner of the business really well. I'm very good, but I didn't want it the spotlight. Now I had to put myself in the spotlight. And um, so when I was growing my um, second newsletter business called No Hassle Newsletter, and I'm reading all about how to create celebrity, you anoint yourself. And I'm, well, what am I going to call myself? And one of my clients, his very first newsletter, he got like three. He was a sales trainer. And I said, listen, it's going to take two, three, four issues to build some momentum. His first issue, he got three new clients. Big Italian guy. He looked just like Kojak, if, if you remember that old show, Bald. And um, he calls me up on the phone and he goes, hey, Palmer, I got three new clients off that thing. He goes, man, you're, I won't say the word, but he goes, you're an effing newsletter guru. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I like that, except the effing part. So I became the newsletter guru. And I, I started renting booths and I had the newsletter guru banner. I had a caricature. My, well, I don't have them all here because I'm traveling mode, but I, my, my initial book about newsletter marketing was Jim Palmer, the newsletter guru. So I put it all out there and it really helped. And then I said, well, instead of just being a business coach or a small business coach, I became the dream business coach, help you have a dream business so you can live your dream lifestyle, dream business radio, dream business podcast. I had dream business TV, everything dream business. So what that says is, Focus. I mean, you have to deliver a good product. You have to know what you're doing and obviously add value. But people will choose you for who you are, not what you do. So if you think about two accountants, one guy goes, I add numbers really, really well. So well, I can add numbers better than the other guy. Well, what kind of a mantra is that? <laughs> but there's a guy who says, I, I work with um, solopreneurs at home who use QuickBooks and, and maybe a couple other things. And that's how I found my accountant like 20 something years ago. And, uh, and I remember I, I, I met somebody at Chamber of Commerce and I looked at his ad and it said, we work with Fortune 500 all the way down to startups and everything in between. So if you're an entrepreneur, you can get like world-class service, blah, blah, blah. And I said, that just doesn't seem believable to me <laughs> that you're going to work with little Jim Palmer's business. And I'm going to say treat fortune. And then there's my guy, Scott. He said, I work with stay at home, small business owners. They have to use QuickBooks. I come to your office once a quarter. He just laid everything out that I didn't want to do. And he's been my account forever. So not that that was great brand. He doesn't have a brand, but do you know what I'm saying? You focus on who you are and that will make you more money than what it is you do. Because I guarantee there's a thousand other people who do what you do. I love that. I love that. And it's, it's really empowering to just sort of honor who you are. Like, I don't have the cleanest language. That mm -hmm. makes some people uncomfortable. Um, I'm 
very much straightforward to the point. You're not going to get a little, a lot of like fluffery from me. I'm not going to fluff yep. my clients. It's a waste butt, of time, you know? I think. Yeah. Um, but when you honor who you are, the right people really appreciate that. And it start, you start to build a reputation. And I'll say that um, as much as we do a tremendous amount of marketing and advertising, the majority of my one-on-one clients are all coming from referrals from other clients. Right. So what's interesting about that, Leisha, is um, you're not only going to attract the right people, but if you are your true authentic self, you will repel the people who don't necessarily blend with that style and you, you're not supposed to attract everybody by the way if you're not repelling some people you're not being your true authentic self because guaranteed not everybody's going to want to work with you so it is a it is a uh, it's a double-edged sword by me not in the beneficial way cut, cut away the people who would who actually if they started working with you and found you a little too abrupt it's just uncomfortable so let those people go and find more of these people you know my my um my clients have uh coined the frame uh coined the term Jim's tough love and the way they know it's coming, whether I'm on a group call or one-on-one is they'll say something and I can just smell like they're just trying to skate around. And I'll say, um, can I be candid with you? <laughs> That's my way of asking. Oh, okay. Here we go. Now I just, I just want to be honest and give you my true feelings about where you are right now, what you're doing, what, what even the last 60 days have been like. I just want to be honest with your permission. Well, of course, but that's my way of saying, what are you doing? You were supposed to do this 30 days ago. It was a piece of, all you have to do is make two phone and whatever it is they're not doing, I will hold them accountable. But I don't just like charge like a bull in a China shop, although I do once they give, like they get their permission, but they know it's coming. So Jim's tough love is you, you let them brace themselves for it. I brace, <laughs> brace it because it's coming. You know? Well, on that note, Jim, you do, um, one-on-one -on -one coaching, you have your, your mastermind. Mm -hmm. I really want to make sure that our, our listeners can connect with you because there are going to be people who are going to say, that's exactly what I need. I need that business centric coach who can keep me accountable, who can help me to get to the next level. So how can our listeners connect with you? So uh, my coaching program, and thank you for asking is dream biz coaching. So it's dream B I Z coaching.com. Uh, my general Jim Palmer personality website is get Jim Palmer. I have to put the get in there because there was a baseball player named Jim Palmer. <laughs> so it's get Jim Palmer.com is my home base. Everything stems off there. Um, and just, if anybody's curious about our lifestyle, we do have a blog, our floating home, the name of our boat is floating home. So if you're just curious what it's like, I'm not sending you to a sales site. I'm not going to woo woo get you into my program, <laughs> but if you want to see what it's like living and traveling on a boat, our floating home.com is our uh, personal blog. Awesome. Any final parting thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Yes. Oh, it's not up there. See, when we're in travel mode, all the decorations are down. But the one thing I did bring, other than my computer from my home office, um, I, I'll pretend I'm getting, it's an hourglass. Oh, and I'm always reminding myself that the sand is running out. Because in 2001, I was diagnosed with cancer. And for about three weeks prior to my surgery, I didn't know if my chances of being alive in five years were 50, 50 or 80, 20. Thank God it was 80, 20. I'm still here. Thank you, Lord. But um, I'm, I was reminded, I, I mean, I was like 41 years old, Alicia. And I'm like, wow, I never thought I'd have to think about these thoughts this early. Well, I never forgot that. It's another reason that I kind of, I, I kicked my own butt in many ways as an entrepreneur because life is short and you don't know. And, um, you know, we've all seen videos and heard that expression on, on your deathbed. You're not going to regret things you did. You're going to regret things you didn't do. So put yourself out there. You can do it. You're worth it. Invest in yourself and make your dream business. Oh, perfect. Perfect <laughs> way to end this segment. Thank you so much for being with us, Jim. What a joy. Thanks for having me on. It, it has been my pleasure to share you with our audience. And of course, I have to thank all of our listeners. You know, we're doing this for you. If you have not already subscribed, please make sure you do so. And until next time, we will see you in the next episode.